the they'll talk about like the different flavors that are in there. And I was trying to see if the Flavier had a flavor wheel. Did they? Uh -uh. Uh well, I can't find the exact batch because it says uh, it's just like a batch two, batch six, batch nine. I don't know which batch this is or if it's the same thing. I don't know. Are you ready? Yep, it's tasty though. Okay. All right, welcome back to part two this week uh, where we're going to answer more of your questions. Again, this is Yawa. You ask, we answer, folks. If this is your first time to the channel, hit the subscribe button. Let's get started. Sounds good. So for first question of part two from Coach Adam Cook. How young can you start your puppy on the easy lead? My pup is between three and four months old. Easy lead. Speaking of easy leads. Dun, dun, dun. They've been out of stock. We had problems getting a little piece that holds the rope ends together. And they were out of stock everywhere. And we finally got them in. And I was informed that we have an abundance. So... Uh, because multiple back orders were placed and they didn't all get canceled. So now we have thousands Lots. and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. So we shouldn't be running out of easy leads anytime soon again. So we're so sorry about the delay in getting them shipped out, but they are going out this week. So thank all of you. Them. Thank you for your business. Thank all you for your patience. And if you haven't got your easy lead yet, go ahead and get on the online store and place your order. So you can get one. You keep jumping out that way, just a smidgen. -y. There you go. Okay. Yes. So to answer your question, how young can you start using an easy lead on your puppy? Typically, mm -hmm. for hunting dogs, we want to see a bold, independent, confident search in the field prior to working on any healing. The reason of that is if you create too much dependence on yourself through healing with your young puppy that you head into the field and they go, huh, I just have to stay in this heel position. I don't feel comfortable getting away from mom and dad. So it's harder to push them out after we've already reined them in. So it's nice to let them learn how to hunt first, then come back to that obedience. And usually anywhere from five to six months is when we're starting to see that Boldness and confidence coming out, sometimes a little bit younger, depending on your puppy. Um, and when they really just start pulling and pulling in their a handful at that point, that's when you really can start using that easy lead. The other would be, those weren't real words. Um, the other would be your real expectations. So if you're not looking for a hunting dog and it's just a, a short hair that's a family companion or any other sporting breed that's an adventure dog. Um, putting an emphasis on healing a little bit younger isn't going to be the end of the world. But uh, I would say that four months is probably going to be the absolute bare minimum. Um, still, five to six is going to be average. Very true. Next question, and I like this one. I'm assuming you're following along with the Muddy Benny litter development series that we've got out. From Brown Dog Boone, what does Muddy's day typically consist of as a nursing mama? Well, Muddy gets it pretty darn easy. She gets to eat and drink pretty much as much as she wants to during this process uh, because that milk production is so important and we have to make sure that she's fully hydrated and has proper nutrition for that milk development um, and production. So the puppies, there were only four of them, so they didn't really stress her out too much as far as milk production goes. But she has the opportunity to hop in the box with them and nurse and lick them and play with them and stay with them. And then when she needs a break, she can hop out. She gets to lay on um, the ground and has chew bones and things like that, as well as she gets to go outside and socialize and play. Uh, she doesn't typically get to come upstairs during this process uh, because of a couple reasons. One is she needs to be able to nurse those puppies when they need her, so she has to be accessible, as well as... Uh, after females have a litter, they are dripping for quite a while and, uh, she'd either have to wear her heat panties upstairs <laughs> or she, uh, we have them in pink and purple. Yeah. Fancy. Um, or she would just be dripping all over the place and I don't want that mess, um, in our 
house. So uh, she needs to be with those puppies though. Now, however, she is to the point where she is done nursing those puppies. So she's going to be able to get back in shape, start doing some more training and yard work and things like that and roading and conditioning like we do with all of our dogs to keep them in shape and get them back in shape. So good question. Perfect. 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 I got to just mark that one or I'll forget that I answered it because that's how my brain works. For those of you that are interested, because I have to get asked, you know, what about this and whatever. This is the um, Kentucky Owl, the gift that Kat got me this year. Uh, very, 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 very cool bottle of bourbon. Um, I belong to a little whiskey club thing, and they have a really neat um, flavor wheel is what they call it. And it shows that this, um, which is Kentucky Owl confiscated, um, has... Big notes of flavor of red apple, floral is a, a flavor that they categorize, banana, cinnamon, citrus, toasty, bread, caramel, spicy. Um, and I can tell you that you can definitely taste the apple. It's mm. a weird thing to say, but interesting. you can, just in case you wanted to. I'm glad you found your flavor wheel. I did. I like to read it. I know you do. That's why you're a part of Flavier and like all your bourbons and trying them out. I know. Next question. Next question from Andrew Berger on Instagram. I'm picking up my first GSP this week and I am interested in joining the Patreon account. Congratulations. Congratulations on the new puppy. For sure. And we'd love to have you join us on our online dog training community. So check it out. But can you guys show us some examples of how our Patreon works? Um, as far as show examples, I could explain it. Yeah. We don't have a producer that can like pop something up on the screen for us yet. Yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yet. Pro- producer, throw that up on the screen real quick. One of these days. So, um, as far as Patreon goes, we have several different tiers. Uh, one of which is the support tier. That's for anybody that reaches out to us and asks, Hey, we love everything you do. Wish there was something more that we could do to say thanks. We set that up. It's a simple $5 um, tier that just is a little bit that you can go, hey, thanks for putting out the content that you do. The next is the $10 tier, and that's the questioner, I believe, is what we refer to it. Um, Basically, it's set up for all of y'all that tried to ask questions here, and and we... Those weren't real words. And we didn't get to your questions. Have another drink. Slow down. Then there's the $25 tier. That is designed for video exchange. So if you want to be able to video your training sessions, this is what we recommend because the most powerful tool that Kat and I have to offer is our ability to read dogs in training situations. Without being able to see them, we can't do that. So video them, upload them to YouTube, share the link. We watch them, tell you what you did right, what you did wrong, where you need to go from there. And then the top tier adds a little more with the ability to set up scheduled phone consults. If you say, here's my video, can I call you? Um, A lot of people really enjoy just the the extra one-on-one time on the phone to be able to, um, you know, spitball some questions and see what's going on. So, Great question. I hope that we helped explain a little bit more what Patreon is all about. Anybody that's interested, it's uh, patreon.com slash standing stone kennels so this is a really good question okay i think that somebody asked a similar one maybe it was the same person actually on the youtube video but they also messaged us on instagram so or or it's a different person with the exact same question who knows i didn't pay enough attention to the youtube comment sorry Um, Justin Berthistle on Instagram, I noticed in your last Sprig video, you were using two commands to release him on the double bumpers. Yep. On the go bird, you would release him with his name, but on the mark bird, you would use a back command. Could you explain using the different command, why it's used and maybe how you teach it? Absolutely. Thanks. Absolutely. It's a great question. And, um, One that I would say that I'm not 100% the best person to ask all of the logistics. I am getting better in the the deep diving into the advanced stuff with labs and retriever work. But basically the gist of it is um, with a marked bird, you're supposed to send the dog with their name. I think that's the setup for 
best I can understand, set up for individual um, duck hunting situations where you have multiple dogs hunting together. You have a bird dropped over here. I can say sprig and he can run and get that one. And when he comes back, he's shaking off, he's warming up. Then my next dog, which um, is to be unnamed, Vex is hunting with us too. I can send him Vex and he can go pick up the next duck and that gives us the ability to not have to be right there, but each individual dog understand who's supposed to be sent for the retrieve in a perfect world. The With um, perfect dogs. With perfect dogs. So the, the next portion of that would be back. Uh, what would you set up for any, it's moving into that blind work. And back is the, the cue that the retrieving world came up with. Just like, why does woe mean woe? Um, don't really know. It's just the word. And, you don't want to fight all of the words. You just kind of use some of them that fit the thing. I mean, otherwise, it's really confusing. But well, we say to our dogs, stop. And everybody's like, well, how do I teach my dog whoa? Well, we don't teach whoa. We teach stop. It just sounds silly. So back is what you're using to send dogs on blinds. And um, a lot of that is developed through pile drills, which incorporate some marks. And then you switch cues to back with each individual repetition after the initial mark. So I hope that explains that. Last question for part two of this week's Yawa from Chet Cotton on Facebook. All right, Chet. Do y'all eat all the birds you shoot while training dogs, both chucker and pigeons? If so, I'm going to need a pigeon recipe, maybe a how to cook <laughs> pigeon video. Well, I, um, you can, if I take this one, go ahead, go ahead by all means. Part two is uh, the guy with the pink gun answers your questions. Maybe I'll get a few more in part three. Okay. We'll see. So uh, as far as do we eat all of the birds in training, first of all, we probably shoot close to four or 5,000 birds a year. So no, we don't eat all of them. Now, the next side of that is... I, I just want to throw that... People are going to be like, you don't eat them all? That's so wasteful. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, and it's not an attempt to be wasteful because that's not what we're about. Um, but pen-raised birds are fairly difficult to keep healthy and alive in a regular situation. So um, we end up having to medicate the birds on a pretty regular basis and not a big fan of eating the medicated birds. That's a big issue. So when we get fresh birds in from the breeder that we get them from, they're really healthy. They're really good birds that way. Haven't been... Overly haven't medicated. been overly medicated. And we do a lot of times clean big batches of those and do um, chucker fajitas or because we primarily chain, we primarily train with chucker. We use chucker in exchange for any, about anything that you would cook chicken in. Cat makes great fajitas. That goes well in that or tacos or you can fry them or you can pound them out a little bit. And Alfredo. Bake them in an Alfredo sauce. Pretty much anything that you would put chicken in, throw some chucker in there. There's a little bit of difference to it, but it is a white meat, super tasty. The next, um, I will be honest, I have never, ever eaten a pigeon, but I do know a guy. Me neither. I do know a guy who has uh, some pretty almost magical ways to turn meat of all sorts, shapes, and sizes into beyond edible, even to the extent of tasty. Are you referring to Jordan? I'm referring to Jordan. Um, he actually has a YouTube channel, Jordan's Harvest. And I just have to throw this out there. If you don't know, we actually met Jordan a long time ago. A very long time ago. This is a really funny story. We should have him on the podcast to tell this story. Okay. Ha, ha, ha cliffhanger. Ha. Cliffhanger. There's a funny how we met Jordan of Jordan's Harvest story. But I will get with him, Chet, and we will get us a pigeon cooking video just for you just for you thank you guys again for watching part two all your great questions we will be back very shortly with part three see you soon